This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there, HRT, in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Starting in January of 2018, each episode I will introduce you to the most notorious and celebrated killers ever associated with La Cosa Nostra. You want in? Take the oath. My name is Anthony. Welcome to the True Crime Mafia. This is an American Crimecast production. Visit us at our new home at accproductions.org. And remember, everyone is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. This podcast is part of the BombPod Media Network. We all must fear evil men, but there is another kind of evil which we must fear most. And that is the indifference of good men. Law enforcement didn't really have a hero. They saw Buford take on big time crime. And they saw him give some people what they had coming to him. Just uh, he fought fire with fire. The wrong kind of people have had their say for too long. And I want to remind them that somewhere in this world, there's a little law and order left. And to let them know in the only way their kind understands that they can't bribe or threaten their way, and they will damn well pay dearly for every crime they commit. He cut his right arm off to help you if you were sincere and needed help, or in two cases if you needed killing or had to be, they could do that too. In the small, rural, southwest Tennessee county of McNary, one man stood up against gang violence, prostitution, illegal stills, murder, and various other vices to put the small county on the map and made his name a legend. That man was Buford Hayes Pusser. Some people in McNair County loved him, some hate him. He seemed like you don't find anybody really just kind of so-so. They're either one or the other. They either thought a lot of him or, or whatever. Now, he wasn't perfect, don't get me wrong, and he was no saint, but I tell you what, he was dealing with a whole different group of people that are out there today. Back in his time, the bootleggers, the uh, mafia type, or what I call the Dixieland Mafia, you know, that was a gang of, of a sort. He was fighting. He was fighting a group of people that ranged from, you know, Chicago, Detroit down to uh, Dixie. Buford Pusser was a man who stood for what he believed in, and would not back down against anyone. From local crime gangs to nationwide mobs, he would not be intimidated, no matter what the cost. My daddy was very open with us about a lot of things concerning that there because of the attempts that had been made on his life. They put contracts out on him, and in doing that also, they had put uh, contracts out on his family members, such as me and my brother at one time. It was very hard to be a small child. You know your daddy is sheriff, and you know that's a dangerous job. And then it's really hard to understand that somebody is actually wanting to kill the children. You know, it's, it, it was a traumatic childhood. However, you know, my dad tried to make it as uh, normal as possible considering you know, what we went through. 
Buford Hayes Pusser died in a fiery crash. Many, including his daughter Dwana, believe that the crash was no accident. The state line mob, along with others, had finally caught up with Buford Pusser. When it's all said and done, nobody else was standing up for the state against the state line mob, and it was a hellish situation going on down there and what was happening to so many people, you know, and being robbed and taken advantage of and how many homes it was affecting and breaking up. And it was just, you know, it was just a mess. You know, that is one thing I'm proud of my father standing up. We lost a lot, though. We lost a lot, and I lost my mother. And I think eventually I lost my dad's life to it because I think that was part of why he died at the age he did because I believe he was murdered, and it still was connections back to that. It's amazing how many people have never heard the name Buford Pusser. There have been seven movies made about him. There's been a TV series. There's been five books written about him, along with four songs. In his life, he was stabbed eight times, shot seven times. He located and destroyed 40 stills in his first year as sheriff at the age of 26. He also took two lives in the line of duty. But Buford Pusser is a very controversial figure. There's no gray area. People either love him or they hate him. One half says he's as crooked as the men he was trying to bring down. The other half said he did what he had to do. You had to fight fire with fire. Now Buford Pusser did die a death under mysterious circumstances. But as I started researching this, I realized there's a lot of circumstances surrounding his life as well. My name is Justin, this is Mysterious Circumstances, and you're listening to part one of the death of Buford Pusser. Hey, what's up, MC Nation? Before we get rocking and rolling on this episode, I do have to give a little couple shout-outs here. The main one being to Mike Rosen, who uh, requested this episode. Fucking great choice, man. Lots of shit going on in this one. I'm not even gonna gonna bullshit you. You had me had me going with this one, but definitely a great great choice, great subject matter. So I hope you are happy. You know, with the overall result, this is a two-part episode. Part one being his story, part two getting into a shit load of facts and investigating his death. Uh, The other two shout-outs definitely have to go to Sarah and her dad, Jim Collier. Jim Collier was kick-ass enough to lend me his voice for a Buford quote that was in the beginning there in the audio clips. Thank you, Jim. I, I greatly appreciate it, man. I know it was last notice. Your voice is fucking amazing. Smooth as silk. Southern gentleman, dude. Uh, I appreciate it immensely. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Sarah, I would give you like a big shout out and say your last name, but legit, like as long as me and you have been friends and you've been a listener of this show, I still do not even have a fucking clue how to pronounce your last name. But anyway, I do have to throw out some disclaimers, okay? While I started investigating this episode, it was definitely geared towards his death. It was not intended to be a two-part episode. But as I started getting into it, I realized that there are a lot of gray area and a lot of controversy surrounding his life as well as his death. Now, as we all know, I wouldn't be doing an episode just on somebody's life. A lot of these events and rumors and... The eyewitness accounts and even autopsy reports that I came across will play a factor when we go to determine the, you know, overall outcome of his death. So I do got to say this as a person who does an investigative podcast, whether it be an unsolved true crime or an unsolved paranormal event that in order to make an accurate assessment of any event, situation, or even the character of a certain person. You have to have all sides of the story. 
you have to take into consideration everything. So with that being said, part one is going to be the official story of Buford Pusser. And I say that because I had to format this episode a lot differently than I have in the past. There's a lot of varying accounts. There's a lot of different stories. Part one will be the official story of Buford Pusser. Part two, I will dissect certain stories, which I will point out in this episode right here, where I will dive into further investigation. And then, like I said, we will go into his death and we will even touch base on his wife's death quite a bit because believe it or not, Buford Pusser himself is regarded by a lot of people as being the person responsible for his own wife's death. So I'm just going to tell you guys right now, I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm not here to defame anybody. I'm not here to do anything like that. I am here to present to you as many facts as I possibly can. Now, whether that changes your opinion of this man or not, I have no control over that. But I just have to say that right now because I'm going to bring up a lot of things that might make you question how much of a hero he truly was. All right. So with that out of the way, I suppose we'll go ahead and get started. Let me go ahead and hit this rum and coke real quick here. Okay, rocking and rolling. Buford Hayes Pusser was born on December 12th, 1937. He was born in Finger, Tennessee. Uh, his parents were Carl and Helen. His dad was a police chief of Adamsville, Tennessee. Uh, Buford Pusser was a pretty fucking big kid. He played varsity basketball and football in high school. Uh, when he graduated in 1956, he decided to sign up for the United States Marine Corps, but his military career ended pretty soon after he joined, uh, while he was still in, uh, basic training. When he was still in basic training, he received a medical discharge for asthma. Uh, his friends all described him as a uh, soft-spoken southern gentleman. As you will come to find out, Buford Pusser was a fucking larger-than-life character. He was also a larger-than-life man. Buford Pusser stood six foot six inches tall, a metric that would be 1.98 meters, and he was 250 pounds of corn-fed country muscle. This dude was big, and he was fucking bad. So after he got his medical discharge for asthma out of the out of the uh, Marine Corps in 1957, he moved to Chicago, where he started a professional wrestling career, where he was known as Buford the Bull. And it should be noted that during his wrestling career, it is said that Buford Pusser wrestled a live bear and won. Now, also in 1957, comes one of the very first Buford stories that I came across that was really interesting that has a little bit of a contradictory twist to it. Now, in 1957, Pusser claims that he was beaten and robbed at a place called the Plantation Club. Obviously, this would be before he had moved to Chicago. He says that he was beaten and robbed at a place called the Plantation Club in 1957. Now, it's often speculated that the person who was responsible for this was somebody named W.O. Hathcock. Now, I will say this. This is where one of the very first Buford stories comes about. And he says that he got into a fight, you know, got attacked, got up, got beaten, and ended up receiving 192 stitches to his head and face. And this is brought to light by a book by W.R. Morris uh, entitled The 12th of August. Now, I do have to let you know right now, you know, we're not going to dive too deep into this in part two, so I'm going to go ahead and give you this information now. There are no police reports, medical records, or newspaper reports regarding this incident or anything like it. 
But the funny thing about this is, is even after Buford had gotten his wrestling career, there are plenty of pictures of Buford in his wrestling gear, and you can visually see that there are no scars visible. Now, where th- whether these scars were somewhere on his head, yeah, it's very possible, hard telling. But there are no newspaper clippings, police reports, or medical reports that ever can corroborate this story. But there is something else interesting. In December of 1959, I'm assuming, and like I said, I'm assuming, that this is right around the time Buford married uh, his wife, Pauline. Uh, They married in December of 5th, 1959. Now, I would like to assume that they traveled home for this wedding, but that's not 100% confirmed. But... In December of 1959, a guy named W.O. Hathcock, same guy I just referenced, was beaten and robbed while he was alone in his club, which was the Plantation Club. His wife had retired uh, to the bedroom for, for the evening or whatever, and he was alone. Now, Buford Pusser and two other men were linked to that event. And they were linked by eyewitnesses who placed them at that club. And on top of that, there's also physical evidence that linked them there as well. There was a laundry marker from Chicago that was found at the scene. And this is where these guys were from. Obviously, Buford had moved there in 1957. Now, contrary to Buford's story... It should be noted that W.O. Hathcock's attack is very well documented both by law enforcement and the hospital as well. So that definitely happened. So I'm just going to give you that little bit of information now to get that out of the way because I'm not going to dive too deep into that. So like I had mentioned on December 5th, 1959, he marries Pauline. Uh, and in 1961, their daughter Dwana is born. That would be their only child together. Now, I did hear a couple of conflicting reports on whether it was 1961 or 1962 that he ends up returning home because his father is having health issues and it would have been technically disabled at this, this point in time. So it is around 1961, 1962 that he does return home. And upon his return, he becomes Adamsville police chief and constable. And he would be the police chief and constable from 1962 until 1964. In 1964, uh, there was a sheriff named James Dickey who dies in some freak car accident. Uh, I really didn't look too much into it because I'm not going to lie, I had my hands full with the Buford Pusser stories. Pusser ends up getting elected sheriff of McNary County, Tennessee at the age of 26 years old in 1964. At that point in time, I'm not 100% sure if that's still standing, but at that point in time, he was the youngest sheriff ever elected in the state of Tennessee. Now, when he gets this job, one of his first lines of duty is he starts going after what is referred to as the Dixie Mafia, also known or loosely affiliated with the state line mob. Now, we're going to touch on the state line mob and the Dixie Mafia a lot in part two because... These were criminal organizations that were running, you know, gambling rackets, moonshining, you know, they were murdering people, they had prostitution rings going on, and this was Buford's very first thing that he was going to go after. And if you would like a little bit more reference to the Dixie Mafia and the State Line Mob, I would like to refer you to American Crime Cast, 
they did a three part series and obviously you guys all know, you know, Shane's Shane's my buddy and we run American Crime Cast Productions together. But they just got wrapped up doing a three part series on the Dixie Mafia and a certain unsolved uh, double murder that is associated with that. So I would like to refer you to that. That will open your eyes as to what kind of shit was going on in the South at this point in time. Because it is said that the, that the Dixie Mafia and the State Line mob um, started up, you know, I, I believe it was right around in the 40s at some point in time, and it was a safe haven for a lot of Chicago mobsters who pretty much could just do whatever the fuck they wanted. And uh, Buford Pusser was not happy with this by the time he got elected sheriff. So he made it a personal point to go after these people first. Now, in 1962 and 63, his first year as a constable and police chief, he does locate and destroy 40 whiskey stills. Now, for those of you outside of the U.S. who don't know what I'll be referring to when I say stills or whiskey stills, it is illegal whiskey, pretty much. It is, uh, you know, corn whiskey. I'm not going to explain to you the whole fucking process of making it because I don't want to sound like I do make it, but it's it's a process of making illegal whiskey. It's not government regulated. It rose to extreme heights during the prohibition era it made a shitload of people a shitload of money and it never died off it was around before prohibition don't get me wrong but during prohibition is where it literally made you know a lot of mafia types you know millions if not billions of dollars so he is credited with locating and destroying 40 stills in his first year as police chief And in 1965 alone, he located and destroyed 87 whiskey stills. That's fucking unheard of, people. It is extremely impressive. So moving on, you know, he starts getting a reputation as being pretty big hard ass. Pretty big guy that quote unquote could not be corrupted. He did not believe in that shit. And he was tired of, you know, God-fearing citizens living in fear. There are many reports around this time from locals, one of which went on to say that her husband was finding a body a month in his farm field. And they were scared to call the cops because of retaliation. A lot of these crimes were not getting reported because of fear of retaliation. And this is what was pissing Buford off. Because this is where he was from. And he was tired of this shit. All this crime. There were murders. I mean these two groups. The Dixie Mafia. And the State Line Mob. Were creating a lot of havoc. Around that State Line area. Alright. And this is what he was trying to. Basically wage war against. So on February 1st, 1966, Buford Pusser gets a call. And he gets a call from an Illinois couple who were on vacation or just traveling through. I'm not 100%. And they say that they were robbed at a place called the Shamrock Motel. And they specifically say the name that they were robbed by a woman. A woman possibly named Louise Hathcock. So Buford shows up. He does show up with backup. Now I'm going to stop right here before I go any further for all the fucking people who are going to email me and be like, this is a total bullshit story. Listen to me. This is the official story. This is one of the things that I'm going to hit on a lot in part two. Because judging by the autopsy report and the eyewitness statements, I'm going to tell you right now, this is Probably not how this fucking shooting went down, but this is the official story and this is part one. So this is how we're fucking doing it. He shows up. Louise Hathcock pulls a concealed 38 caliber pistol and takes a shot at Buford Pusser. Now, apparently while she is trying to take the next shot, her gun jams and he 
goes ahead and shoots her four times. Now, like I said, we're going to get into the details of this in part two, but this is the official story. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this shooting. Said it before, I'll say it again. It's a very, very touchy subject, especially for a lot of the people around that area. We will get a little bit into Louise Hathcock uh, in part two as well. Now, from then on... Everything is a little bit quiet. Um, obviously, Buford Pusser gets a lot of recognition for what happens at the Shamrock Motel. Everything's quiet for a little bit. And then we move on to January 2nd, 1967, where Buford Pusser stops, uh, performs a traffic stop for speeding, and he is shot um, three times. Now, I couldn't find any official reports on this. I did find a newspaper article from um, January 3rd, 1967 in the Corinthian. I did find uh, one article in a newspaper from January 3rd, 1967. So, there's this more than likely did happen. And until uh, about six months later, everything is pretty quiet. And by this time, like I said, Buford Pusser is starting to get a lot of recognition, a lot of fame. He's starting to build himself a reputation. He is a big guy, and he is pretty much taking the law into his own hands. Now, we go ahead and we move on to about August 12th. 1967. Buford Pusser receives a phone call at about 4 a.m. about a disturbance on New Hope Road in McNary County. His wife Pauline decides to ride along with him. As he's riding down New Hope Road, he passes New Hope Methodist Church, and he's pretty much looking for any kind of uh, signs of trouble or disturbance or anything like that. Now, while he's doing this, Buford Pusser says that he really didn't notice any car behind him. But all of a sudden, he hears a car engine roar and whip up to the left side of him on the driver's side. And a hail of bullets smash into this driver's side window where Buford, uh, Buford was sitting. There's a lot of glass thrown into his face. Now, these shots missed Buford, but struck Pauline, his wife, and killed her instantly. She slumped down onto the floor, dead. Pusser sped up to try to get away. Now, about three miles down the road, uh, Buford stopped his car, and he thought he had lost whoever was shooting at him. The uh, quote, what is often referred to as the August 12th ambush, or, uh, you know, one of the assassination attempts on Buford's life. So he gets three miles down the road, and uh, shortly after he stops, this Cadillac appeared again, and it started firing more bullets. At this point in time, two of them hit Pusser in the face. Um, he took two, if not three, shots from a thirty caliber combine rifle to the jaw pretty much blowing his jaw off. It wasn't all the way off, and yes, I do have pictures of this. I will post them in the group. They are extremely graphic, so I will warn warn you on that. Now, Pusser was taken to a hospital in uh, Selmer, Tennessee, and then he was eventually transferred to a hospital in Memphis. Now, he was in the hospital for 18 days, and over the course of the next seven years, received 16 surgeries to reconstruct his face back to the point where it was half-ass normal. So when I say that this fucked him up, it fucked him up. Okay, that's not an over-exaggeration at all. But what happened after this was Buford Pusser vowed revenge on the people who killed his wife. And this is where the legend comes from. He identified four shooters. 
He identified them in a 1965 blue Cadillac. Some people say blue, some people say black. I've heard, I've read both accounts. We're not a hundred percent sure, but we do know it was dark colored. But from what I understand, Buford Pusser himself said that it was a blue Cadillac. Now he identified four shooters. One of them is Carl White, known as Toehead White. Another one is George McGann, Gary McDaniel, and a gentleman named Kirksey Nix. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, Kirksey Nix, we're going to talk a lot about him in part two. Because he's no stranger to trouble around the southern states. I can tell you that much right now. Buford ended up changing his story at the last minute. And he said that he could not identify the shooters by picture or in person. So nobody was ever prosecuted for the murder of his wife, Pauline. But on a funny little side note, Carl Toehead White was gunned down outside of El Rey Motel in Corinth, Mississippi in 1969 by a random little thug named Barry Smith. And as irony would have it, Toehead White was shot in the head with a 30 caliber rifle, the same caliber that did kill Pauline Pusser. Now, a lot of the authorities that would be state and federal did believe that this uh, Barry Smith guy was hired by Buford Pusser to kill Toehead White. Obviously, there's no proof of that. That is just hearsay and allegation. And it pretty much came to pass. Nothing ever happened with it. Another story that comes to light about one of the killings that Buford Pusser had to make was on Christmas Day, 1968. Pusser was forced to kill a man named Charles Russell Hamilton. Now, Hamilton's landlord, a guy named Don, called Pusser and told him that his relative was drunk and threatened to shoot him and his wife. Hamilton had actually killed his mother and a man from Alabama. Pusser made the call, and after Hamilton shot at the sheriff, Pusser killed him. This would be his second killing in the line of duty. Now, both cases were heard by the McNary County Grand Jury, and both were ruled in self-defense. Now, in 1970, Pusser ends up ineligible for re-election due to a term limit. And then he was defeated in his bid for sheriff in 1972. He did blame the loss on the movie, which was being made, because in 1973, the movie Walking Tall came out. Now, he said that he was out and about, and he was trying to promote the film, and that, you know, he couldn't campaign. He was, he was a technical advisor for the movie. So he pretty much, you know, said, you know, hey, that's why I lost, blah, blah, blah. But he was reelected as constable of Adamsville by a majority of voters. And the best part about this is, is that he was elected. He wasn't even on the ballot. People wrote his name in and he won by a majority vote. And he remained constable from 1970 until 1972, all right? So I do have to let you know that little side note right there. But also in 1970, two of the other shooters, McDaniel and McGann, were both found shot dead in Texas. Buford Pusser was also suspected in their shootings, but obviously nothing was ever proven. Now, in 1971, Kirksey Nix ends up murdering a wealthy grocer from New Orleans by the name of Frank Corso, and gets a, he'll eventually get sentenced to Louisiana State Pen in Angola for that murder right there. I mean, like I said, we're going to touch base a lot on Kirksey Nix in part two because he does have a lot to do with this. Now, in 1973... The very first Walking Tall movie comes out, and Buford Pusser is officially a legend. Now, granted, there's a lot of Hollywood going on right there. There's a lot of shit. 
You know, we all know how Hollywood is with based on a true story stuff. And that's pretty much where we can end that discussion. But this does pretty much solidify him as the walking tall legend. And just so you know, no, he never carried a big fucking stick around, alright? That was totally something that he made up for the fucking movies. And his old house in Adamsville, which is now a museum, actually has a big stick. And I think it was just in reference to the movie, to be perfectly honest with you. Now, after, you know, he starts getting pretty famous from this movie. Now, I will say this. uh, Buford Pusser did make a little amount of money from the movie. He signed his contract for 7% of profits, and then he would receive $1,000 for every personal appearance that he did make to promote the movie or whatnot. So he was doing pretty good. It only took um, $1.5 million to make that movie, and it made $40 million at the box office. So Buford Pusser was doing pretty well. So on August 20th of 1974, Buford Pusser signs a contract with Bing Crosby Studios out of Memphis to play himself in the sequel to Walking Tall. And then on August 21st, 1974, he holds a press conference early in the day to announce that he will be playing himself in the sequel. It was a pretty big deal around the area. Um, but this August 21st, 1974 is also a very important day because this is the day that Buford Pusser passes away. And here's what happened as we know it. He holds a press conference earlier in the day for the, about the movie. He ends up going to the McNary County Fair with his daughter, Duana. They walk around the midway. He eats a little bit of food. And she asks him if she can ride home with some of her friends. He says, that's fine, whatever. So they go ahead and leave almost at the same time. Duana leaves with her friends a little bit before Buford does. Now, Duana states that Buford Pusser passes her car, or the car that she is a passenger in, goes down the road, goes out of sight. Buford Pusser is driving, I've heard two different years, a 1973, and I also heard a 1974. I did read 1973 more, so I'm going to say a 1973 specially modified Corvette. No top on it. All that good stuff. All the bells and whistles. Now what happens, according to the accident report and the reconstruction of the wreck, Buford Pusser is traveling east on Highway 64. At some point in time, he hits his brakes. We don't know why. He is traveling east in the right lane. There are 545 feet worth of skid marks going from the eastbound lane, crossing center line, over into the westbound lane, then into the fucking grass or parking lot of an old shell service station, then crossing Lawton Road, then hitting an embankment, at which point Buford Pusser is ejected from the vehicle. And at that same point, the car bursts into flames. We will talk about this in part two, but immediately it was suggested as sabotage because of the war that he had waged against the Dixie Mafia and the state line mob that they had sabotaged his car, all right? They say that they they did something to either the steering mechanism or the tie rods or something of that sort. Like I said, we'll talk about this a lot in part two. But the worst part about it is, the first person on the scene of the accident is his daughter. The vehicle that Duana is a passenger in pulls up to the scene of the accident. She gets out of the vehicle, goes over to her father, where he's barely still alive. 
she said. I, I'm pretty sure that he said my name twice, and then he died in my arms. I tell you what, I feel a lot for Dwana. She lost her mother at six years old. She lost her father when she was still a teenager. And not only that, her mother was murdered, and her father fucking died in her arms, man. A lot of allegations going around. GM was called in to investigate the car. A Kentucky state trooper is the one who actually reconstructed the accident and laid it all out in diagram, which I will post when I post this episode in the group. But I guess, let's talk about something real quick. In Buford Pusser's life, he is said to have been shot eight times, stabbed seven. At one point, there's a story of him fighting six men who were trying to kill him. He sent three of them to the hospital, then arrested the other three. This guy was hard as a coffin nail. And I'm not going to lie to you, like, all the research that I did on this, and I know part one, you guys are like, oh, it took you forever to get this episode out, part one's a little bit short, all bullshit aside, I started looking into the details of my part two episode long before part one, because it depends on who you ask. There's a lot of people who think Buford was more corrupt than any of the criminals that he ever went after. There's stories of him shutting down whiskey stills just because it eliminated all the competition. They implicate him in the death of his own wife, saying that she was going to leave him and expose all of his lies and all of his misdeeds. And basically tell the world that he's not this great big hero that everybody thought he was. But this is part one. And this is not what we are here to talk about. Because, like, whether you think Buford Pusser is a good guy, or a bad guy, or a corrupt cop, the most corrupt cop you've ever seen. Or a fucking lawman who tried so hard to fight against corruption and to make sure that the locals didn't fear, you know, making phone calls to the cops, didn't fear all the regular bullshit that they've been dealing with forever. I'm not here to sway your opinion on him. I'm here to state facts. In part two, I will tell you what's fact. I will tell you what's opinion. I will tell you what's hearsay. I will tell you what is backed up with evidence. Before we close out, I am going to end this episode with the few nice words from Dwana Pusser. I will say this. Whether he was a good man, whether he was a bad man, I don't really think it matters. And here's why. Because Buford Pusser inspired people. He inspired regular people to be great people. He inspired kids. He inspired adults to go into law enforcement. And I know there's always been a bad rap for law enforcement, especially in the U.S. here lately. But you know what? Fuck that shit. These people go out there and they put their lives on the line every single day. Whether it's a traffic stop, whether it's a fucking house call, it doesn't matter. These people risk their lives every single day. When somebody's holding up a bank, you ain't going to go in there. First thing you're doing is calling the cops. I mean, don't bullshit yourselves. Not all heroes wear capes. Just him being able, not even him, the story of him. Being able to inspire people to be better human beings and to serve other people and to risk their lives every single day, that means something to me. That counts for something in my book. Whether you feel the same or not, hey, you know, that's on you. Part two, 
probably going to blow your minds with a lot of information. But in closing, I would like to say thank you to all our civil servants. Thank you to the men and women who put on their uniforms every single day and risk their lives. And a lot of them were inspired by Buford Pusser, whether he was a good or bad man. So, I will see you fine folks on the flip side. People in law enforcement will go, that's exactly why I got law enforcement. I saw your daddy's movies when I was younger, and that's what I decided I wanted to be like him. You know, I wanted to be in law enforcement. I wanted to make a difference. People need, are looking for maybe a hero type, somebody that stood up for the underdog. Like those folks that lived in there and said, you're not going to keep bullying these people. He was going to try to do it. He had no deputies at that time. He had started and on his, when he ran for office, his motto was, I answer all calls. And he did. Be, first of all, so humble. Humble that people remembered what he done. He would never dream that people would be coming still to this day all over that they remembered him for what he stood up for. visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi said, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth.